Hi, welcome to episode two of Live Security's Malware Analysis Series. Last time we examined drive-by downloads. This time I'll demonstrate one of the most devious weapons in the hacker's arsenal, the rootkit. This is part one of two rootkit videos. What is a rootkit? From the days when Unix was king, root means an administrator account with the most privileges. A hacker who gains root on your system has a lot of control. He then uses a kit of his favorite tools to extend that control. Once this kit drops on a victim's machine, it usually installs utilities, scripts, and exploits within seconds. These tools can do almost anything a digital ninja wants. Elevate his privileges, install back doors, record keystrokes, send data back to the attacker, and even execute programs to hide all these activities. However, the definition of rootkit has evolved over time. Nowadays, when someone mentions rootkit, they usually mean the tools used to hide the presence or activity of an intruder on your computer. Sometimes rootkits hide so well you can't find them even when you know they're there. Stick around, I'll show you how it's done. To explain how attackers hide on your computer, first let's review. How do you ever know what's happening on a Windows PC? You probably do some of the following things. You look at files in Windows Explorer or by doing a DIR from the command line. You might use Task Manager to see running processes. You could check entries in the Windows registry using regedit. You could also scan for network connections using a command like netstat. And finally, you'd probably inspect log entries and audit trails. A Windows rootkit hides from all those techniques. How? Any way it can. The easiest way to explain is to show you a rootkit in action. So let's take a look at one of the most common rootkits found in the wild today, Hacker Defender. Let's jump right in and configure Hacker Defender on an imaginary victim's PC. Hacker Defender comes with several files, but I'll focus on three of them. hxdef100.exe is the executable which installs Hacker Defender's services and runs the rootkit. hxdef100.ini is the configuration file that allows you to set up Hacker Defender. bdcli100.exe is the client software that can connect to Hacker Defender's backdoor. I explain more about this in part two. Normally, you and I are white hats, but in this scenario, we're role playing as a black hat attacker. Let's say we've exploited an Internet Explorer vulnerability to gain administrative control of an unsuspecting victim computer. We've then created two directories on it to store our rootkit files. One directory, badkit, contains my malicious toolkit with all the programs that I intend to hide. This second directory contains the Hacker Defender files. To hide my presence, I first have to work my way through Hacker Defender's configuration file. The first section of Hacker Defender's config file is called Hidden Table. Here you list all the files you want to hide from the Windows file system. Hacker Defender supports wildcard characters, making it easier to hide a bunch of files at once. For example, I've added the prefix bad to my other malicious files. Then I can hide them all at once by adding bad star to this hidden table section. By default, the config already includes a line which hides all the Hacker Defender files. Next, the hidden processes section. This is where you tell Hacker Defender which running programs to hide from Windows Task Manager. These are often the same programs you would have Hacker Defender hide from the Windows file system. So I've added the same two lines to this section of the config, bad star and hxdef star. Under the section of the config called root processes, 
you specify which processes should remain unaffected by the rootkit. Every attacker has his favorite programs he uses to see what's really on his system, even after his rootkit is activated. I want to fool others who use this computer, not myself. So here, I list the processes that should still be able to see my hidden stuff even after I activate Hacker Defender's cloaking capabilities. The Hidden Service section is where you tell Hacker Defender what Windows services to hide on the PC, for example, itself. If any of your other malicious programs install themselves as services, you would add them here. Since we're playing the role of a black hat attacker, let's add WinLogon, a keystroke logger that will capture the victim's logins. Hidden reg keys and hidden reg values are the sections where you list all the Windows registry stuff you want to hide. By default, Hacker Defender hides its own registry keys. If other utilities in your rootkit install registry keys, you add them to this list as well. So I'll add the win logon registry keys here so the administrator can't find our keystroke logger. So far, I've configured Hacker Defender to hide from the owner of this computer in at least four ways. But I'm not done though. Hacker Defender, plus my keystroke logger, plus any evil utilities I might have installed all take up hard drive space. Some clever user might have noticed his hard drive has gotten fuller. So let's deal with that. To do so, simply add up all the bytes your malicious programs take up and add that number to Hacker Defender's config file under the section called Free Space. My attack code takes up a couple of megs, so I enter that here. Now Hacker Defender will intercept any queries asking how much hard drive space is left on this computer and add a couple of megs to the response, making it look as if it is not there. In the startup section of the configuration file, you add programs and tasks for Hacker Defender to run automatically when it first installs. I'll add a command that loads netcat. This way, I can force the victim's machine to listen on TCP port 1337. And later, when I connect to that port, the machine will send me an administrative command shell. Hacker Defender can hide this port activity and also hide any TCP or UDP ports the victim's computer connects to or listens on. To hide activity caused by my netcat command, I just add 1337 to the TCP incoming list in the config file. To be super stealthy, I'll also add that port to TCP outgoing and UDP. Hacker Defender has several more settings to configure, but I've shown you the most important ones. The configuration is done, so I'll save it. Now we're ready to see what happens when I activate Hacker Defender. Remember, in this scenario we're trying to hide our presence on a victim computer we've taken over. I've already been actively working on the victim PC, which leaves telltale signs. I'll never get away with this attack if the administrator sees any of the following stuff. Viewing the computer's C drive in Windows Explorer, I can readily see the two directories I made. Worse, I can also see all the malicious programs in those directories. Using my remote command shell, I'll open a DOS prompt and run one of the programs in those directories. This command starts netcat listening on port 1337. If the owner of this computer happens to open Task Manager, he can see Netcat's process listed. Not very stealthy. I can also see Netcat listening on port 1337 by running a program called Netstat. If I start my malicious keystroke logger now, its registry keys show. I need to hide these too. The stuff I've just shown you represents some of the ways an admin can detect my presence on his PC. Can Hacker Defender cover my tracks? Let's get rooted!
I'm activating Hacker Defender now. Now my folders don't appear in Explorer. I never stopped the Netcat process, but look at Task Manager. Netcat isn't there anymore. We can't see Netcat's listening port either. However, I can prove Netcat is still running by connecting to the victim computer on port 1337. I immediately get the command shell I set up, so Netcat is still running. Finally, remember our malicious keystroke logger's registry keys? Let's go back and see if we can find them. Look at that! They're gone! As you can see, Hacker Defender is covering my tracks quite well. And consider this, I performed this entire attack manually so you could see what was happening. A real attacker would script the entire process so that it would execute within seconds. You've now seen how an attacker uses a rootkit, and you've seen what a rootkit can hide. But you haven't seen what happens behind the scenes to make these stunts possible. For more on how rootkits work technically, join me for part two of our Malware Analysis Cubecast. Meanwhile, we always want to know what you think of our live security videos. Send your feedback to your.opinion.matters at watchguard.com. See you in part two.